This is a 2003 Ferrari Enzo, and it's one of Ferrari's five modern supercars. When this car came out back in 2003, the sticker price was around $650,000. But today, 15 years later, nice examples are selling for between two and a half to three million dollars. Today, we're going to find out why. First, I should mention I've borrowed this Enzo from Dutton Garage here in Melbourne, Australia, which is a car dealership whose inventory includes some of the greatest exotic sports cars of all time and some cool modern exotics and other sports cars. You can check out Dutton Garage's inventory if you click the link in the description below. I've also got some more videos coming soon with more of their cool cars. Why would I go all the way to Australia to make a YouTube video? Because this isn't just any car. In fact, this isn't just any Ferrari. This is one of the all-time greats. It's one of Ferrari's five modern supercars, the other ones being the 288 GTO, the F40, the F50, and the LaFerrari. But only this one had the distinction of being named after the company's founder. And of course, the Enzo is special for other reasons, too. Now, the Ferrari F430 is rare. But Ferrari built 15,000 of those. Meanwhile, they only made 400 Enzos. I say 400 in quotes because Ferrari says they built 400 of these, but there are crazy people out there devoted to tracking down the serial numbers on every single Ferrari, and they've got more than 400 serial numbers for the Enzo, suggesting Ferrari may have bent the truth and built a few more than they said in order to make the car seem a little rarer and more appealing to collectors. Not that they needed to, of course, because they could have made thousands of these things and it would still be really appealing. Back here is a 6 liter V12 with 660 horsepower and 490 pound-feet of torque. It sent this thing from 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds, which was insane back in 2003 and it's still pretty crazy today. And there's more, of course. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of the Enzo and show you all of the quirks and features of a $3 million Ferrari. And for more of my thoughts on the Enzo, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer. Now I'm going to start in front, specifically with the front overhang, which is a design element of this car that I've always found rather interesting. If you look in the back, the overhang in the rear behind the rear wheels is like four inches. In the front, it's like three feet from the front of the front wheel all the way to the tip of the car. I've never really understood why they did that, although I think the intent was to try to recreate the look of the Formula One cars on a road car, and so it had to have sort of a long pointy front end. Now, if you've ever wanted to know what's in the Ferrari Enzo's long front overhang, I'm going to show you. First, let's talk about how to get inside. You go into the driver's door jam, in the front there's a little latch. You pull that little latch, and then it pops the front compartment to this point. Then you go underneath, you pull a little tab and then you open it right up and when you open it it reveals the single smallest cargo compartment ever installed in an automobile i'm serious it's just ridiculously tiny there's no way you could carry anything up here then again it's better than what the ferrari f40 had up here which is just fans and basically no cargo compartment at all now, one of the things you notice when you open up the Enzo's front compartment, beyond just how ridiculously tiny it is, is that there are four leather straps holding on three containers in the inside of the car. Now, the first container, this one here, is a leather pouch with a zipper on top that contains the tire jack. Next, you have this container here. It's circular. You unzip it, and it contains the tool to remove the Enzo's center lock wheels. The Enzo doesn't have lug nuts like a traditional vehicle. Instead, it has center lock wheels with one giant nut in the middle of the wheel holding the wheel in place. And so in order to get them off, you need a tool like this. Now, I really like those two little leather pouches. Not only are they nice, they feel nice, they look good, they have nice zippers on them, but also they have the little Ferrari prancing horse embossed into the leather on top meaning that replacing one of those little leather containers would probably be like $900 per leather container. Neither of those things are as interesting as the toolkit. Now that's the other container in here. It's not made of leather. Instead, it's a more durable material. When you open it up, you find several wrenches, all of which have Ferrari printed on them. But that isn't the most interesting thing in the toolkit. The most interesting thing is pull the top layer of the toolkit back, go into the bottom, and you will see 
extra bulbs. That's right, if a light bulb goes out on your end zone, you simply must replace your faulty turn signal by the side of the road. Well, you just get in there with the toolkit and replace your bulb by the roadside in your $3 million car. I suspect no one has ever used those bulbs. However, I also suspect everyone who's ever tried to sell one of these has made sure to advertise that they have the original toolkit, including all bulbs, making you wonder if Ferrari just puts it in there as sort of a collector's item. Now, a couple of other interesting things in here under the front compartment. If you move past the cargo compartment and a little further towards the windshield, you will see a little dial marked off. Well, that's the battery cutoff. Ferrari, you see, they know their customers. They know people will buy this car and then not drive it for long periods of time, years in fact, to keep miles off it and keep the value up. So you can turn off the battery so it doesn't just run down and then eventually go flat while the car is sitting. Another interesting piece up here, getting close to the windshield, you can see there's carbon fiber everywhere in this car, no surprise, but you can also see that the little windshield washer squirter jet things are mounted on sort of mountains of carbon fiber in order to get them high enough in order for them to actually be effective at squirting the windshield. So basically you have this piece of carbon fiber and all of it's roughly the same elevation except the two mountains of windshield squirter jets. Speaking of windshield squirter jets, one interesting thing to note, the Enzo has just one single windshield wiper. It's a very strangely shaped windshield and one wiper covers it all. The one wiper doesn't get tucked under the hood when it's not in use. Instead, it just sort of sits there on the passenger side of the window. Another interesting item up front is in the front fender. Now you can see when you turn on the turn signal, it just looks like a normal turn signal inside the headlight housing. But if you look over on the side, there's also this baby little turn signal circle that turns on along with it that sort of provides supplementary turn signal information. Next up, we move into the engine. But before we get there, I want to discuss the rather unusual procedure for opening up the engine compartment. Now, it starts simple enough. There's a little latch in the back of the driver's door jam. You pull it and then that pops open the engine compartment. Then it's a two-person job because it's so heavy and this car is so wide. Two people lift it up. But then the interesting thing that happens next is the hood prop. It's not just planted on top of the engine cover and it's not stuck in the engine bay like in most cars. Instead, it's just sort of clipped into the engine bay and you can remove it. But maybe the most unusual thing about the hood prop is the fact that there's just a little piece of cloth wrapped around it. That's in order for you to be able to still prop up the hood in case it gets too hot. The prop is made of metal and if the car has been driving for a while, the prop could be very hot. So they wrap this little piece of cloth around so you can just lift it up with your hands and then pull it out, which is a very nice little touch. Now, once you've taken the prop out and unclipped it, the procedure of actually installing it is a rather unusual one. You stick the bottom part into this giant hole that's made to receive the prop and then you sort of lightly set down the engine cover on the top part and then the hood prop is in place and your engine cover is open. And with the engine cover open, well, just take a look. You can gaze at the beauty of the six liter V12. It is massive. It is all exposed. It is absolutely gorgeous, incredibly cool to see. Now, while you're looking at the engine, I want you to keep in mind a couple of things. Like I mentioned before, it's a six liter V12, 660 horsepower, 490 pound feet of torque, zero to 60 and 3.1 seconds and this car had a top speed of 222 miles an hour which was really fast 15 years ago and well, it's still really fast, really, really fast. Now, there are a couple of other interesting things under the hood that I think are worth mentioning. I wanna start with the suspension. Now, a normal car suspension is right behind the wheels and tires. This car, however, has inboard suspension, which is sort of mounted horizontally, kind of in the middle of the whole engine bay. It's very unusual when you open up the engine cover to see the engine sitting there, but also the suspension sort of sitting between the engine and the rear of the car. A couple of other interesting items under the hood. How about the fact that this little diagram shows that you're not supposed to put your hand here, but doesn't it kind of look like it's flipping you off just a little bit? I've always found it funny that they use that diagram. The middle finger is just a little bit too high for me to think that that wasn't intentional. Now, another interesting item related to the engine cover would be the fuel door. Now, if you looked when I showed how to open the engine compartment, you'll notice there are two little latches on the driver's door jam. One is for the engine compartment. The other one is for the fuel door. Now, the interesting thing about the fuel door in this car is it's integrated 
integrated into the engine cover. This is probably the only car I've ever seen where when the engine cover is open, you can't get to the fuel door. That isn't the case on your Toyota Camry. Now, when the engine compartment is closed, you can see you pull on that little latch, the fuel door pops right open, and then you can stick fuel in. But when the engine compartment is open, you can see the two things are sort of separated from each other. And when you pull on the little latch, you can see the mechanism working, but obviously it doesn't do anything since the fuel door is now raised as it's part of the engine cover. Now, another interesting item I feel like I should bring up while I'm back here is this car's name. Now, I've called it the Ferrari Enzo throughout this video, and that's basically what everybody calls it. But if you take a look at this little warning label, it's written in Japanese because this car was originally delivered to Japan, you can see everything is Japanese except the bottom right where it says Enzo Ferrari. Now, there's a reason for that. That's because according to Ferrari, this car was supposed to be called the Enzo Ferrari, not the Ferrari Enzo, not the Ferrari Enzo Ferrari, just the Enzo Ferrari, as it was named after the founder of the company, Enzo Ferrari. It's the same with the La Ferrari. You're not supposed to call it the Ferrari La Ferrari. It's just the La Ferrari or La Ferrari. Unfortunately, everybody thinks those things are kind of stupid, so no one ever really did that. We all called it the Ferrari Enzo, despite what Ferrari told us, but technically the name of this car was the Enzo Ferrari. And if you look in the driver's door jam, there's a little label in there that says the exact same thing, Enzo Ferrari, rather than Ferrari Enzo. That was the car's official name. Now, since we're talking about the door jam, we might as well talk about the doors. This car is an unusual car, and thus it has unusual doors, and they open in an unusual way. Now, to open them, you stick your hand into sort of this little divot right behind the door back here. There's a little latch underneath there. If you get in, you pull on it, and then the door opens right up. And when it opens up, this is how it looks. Now, one interesting item with the doors in the Enzo, you can see they're both fully open right now. And although a normal car door sort of ends right here, right along the top of the window, the Enzo's doors also contain part of the roof over the passenger seat and over the driver's seat. So when the Enzo's doors are up, actually most of the roof is also up as well because the doors have part of the roof. They have sort of an unusual shape as a result of that. Next up, a couple of other interesting door-related quirks. I want to start with this hinge. Take a look at this thing. It's the only hinge for the door, and it is absolutely massive. Very different from a hinge you would find on a normal car, but then again, this is a very different door. Also interesting, if you close the door, you can see one other interesting piece is this keyhole. This whole car is this beautiful red body, unbroken by any annoyances. And then there's just this keyhole randomly placed here on the side of the door. It's like eight inches from the end of the door. It, it, it has no apparent reason to be where it is, and it's not all that attractive. And it's also on the driver's side. You go over there and you can see the keyhole over there as well. Obviously, this is in case you get locked out, your keyless entry isn't working, but it seems sort of like an odd placement for that. Next up, climbing into the Enzo, there are, as you can imagine, quite a few interesting quirks in here. I'm going to start with getting out, which is quite an odd thing. The door handle is very strange. It isn't just a usual door handle like in your car. Instead, it has this weird stair step pattern, and then you pull it, and then it opens up the door, and then you can climb out. Now, if you want to close the door when you're inside the car, there's this large handle. You pull that, and the door closes. It's actually not any more difficult than pulling closed a door in a normal car. Next up, one of the first things you notice when you climb inside, there's a little label in the driver's footwell that says 399, limited production. Yeah. Anyway, 399 is the number Ferrari originally claimed they built, and then they said they built one more as a gift for the Pope. He later auctioned it off for charity, and so there are 400 Enzos according to Ferrari. Another label inside the car is in the middle, and that would be the one that has Enzo Ferrari's signature on it. And that is a pretty cool little label to look at when you drive down the street. I often make fun of the labels in these cars that say like one of 300 or whatever. The Enzo Ferrari signature, I'm not gonna make fun of that. That's just cool. Next up, you might be wondering if I'm in Australia, why I'm sitting on this side of the car. Well, that's because every single Ferrari Enzo was left-hand drive. So sorry if you were in Great Britain, Japan, South Africa, Australia, you had to have a left-hand drive Enzo. Now, Pininfarina, the designer of this car, they offered to convert Enzos to right-hand drive if someone really needed, but I don't think anybody ever took them up on it. And so 
All Enzos are left-hand drive. Next up, an interesting item between the driver's seat and the door, that would be the parking brake. It's rather unusual. Basically, the way it works is you pull it to engage it, and then you can push it down, even though it's on, it's down on the floor, so that it's out of your way if you want to get in and out of the car. If you want to disengage it, you pull it back up, and then you push the button and disengage it from there. Now, a lot of older Ferrari models had their parking brake in this style, but it was outdated by the time the Enzo came out, and yet the Enzo used it anyway, probably to free up space in here where the parking brake otherwise would have gone. And speaking of old school items inside this car, as you can see, this car has paddle shifters. Interestingly, this car has the old F1 transmission, which is basically a single clutch sequential manual. It's a manual except with an automated clutch. By modern standards, that's considered to be sort of a weak link. In the era of quick shifting dual clutches, the old F1 transmission is not really all that great. It's not that fast and it's not as engaging as a manual. Nonetheless, the Enzo came from that era, and so that's the transmission it has. But back to the door panels for the next interesting item, that would be the window rollers. This car has crank windows in order to save weight, and that's a fairly standard thing. But the interesting thing about this particular car is the window rollers are like none I've ever seen before. It's just a circle on the door panel, and you move the handle around the circle, and that rolls down and rolls up the window. It's actually kind of an ingenious thing. I don't know why the Enzo ended up being the only car with these weird circular window rollers. Every other car has basically the same boring window window roller design, but if you want excitement from your window roller, the Enzo has bucked that normal window roller trend. And by the way, speaking of the windows, they're minuscule. They come up in the back, and the front part is sort of taken up by this quarter window, and so the window itself is tremendously tiny. So even though you can roll it down using those cool window rollers, you don't really get all that much air in the cabin. Next up, moving back into the driver's footwell, first off, take a look at these pedals. Look at these things. They look like they're from a vintage Ferrari, like from the 60s. They're absolutely old school, but they're the pedals from the Enzo. They're really cool looking. I mean, they even have Ferrari sort of printed in the metal on the bottom. It's a very cool look. Also interesting in the driver's footwell is this little red pad of leather to the right of your knee. I guess they were thinking if your knee would hit the carbon fiber, it would scuff it or damage it. So instead, they put the pad there. The passenger footwell does not have the red leather pad. That is weight savings. Next up, moving on to the seats themselves. These seats are our sport seats, obviously. They're not leather. Instead, they're this sort of mesh material, which I'm sure is weight-saving in some way, shape, or form. They're also very tight. This is not a car for big people. Now, the seats have two controls. There's the standard control to move them forward or backward, like in virtually every car. And then there's this little latch on the side. That little latch controls the backrest. You pull it, and you can move the backrest forward or backwards. That's all you get. Forward and backwards for the bottom, forward and backwards for the backrest. Everything else? Too bad. Next up, I want to mention the covers. Now, this car was sold not only with a car cover, but you can also get a cover for each individual seat. It was this red cover that went over the seats to protect them. That's not all that unusual, although maybe it's a bit overkill. The crazy one, though, is the steering wheel cover. Look at this thing. You take it off the steering wheel, it looks like a shower cap, but you could put it on there, and then you could protect your steering wheel from fading in the sun for all those times you let your Enzo sit outside. Now, speaking of the steering wheel, there are a couple of other interesting steering wheel related items. One of them is the fact that the steering wheel contains the turn signal indicators. They're not on a little stock coming off the steering wheel like every other car. Instead, there's little buttons with arrows on them, one to the left, one to the right, and you push those to turn on the left and right turn signals. That was unusual at the time, although a few other Ferrari models have adopted it since then, and also the Lamborghini Huracan. The theory is it kept your hand on the steering wheel and not sort of rooting around looking for stocks or whatever. If the signals were there, you never had to take your hand off the steering wheel when you were performance driving on the track using your turn signals. Now, there are a couple of other interesting buttons on the steering wheel that are worth mentioning. Specifically, on the left side, you have the button for the axle lifter system. You push that, and the car lifts its front axle a couple of inches off the ground for better ground clearance so it can clear speed bumps and other bumps you might encounter on the road. Now, other supercars have axle lifter systems, but I bet they don't sound like this. Ah, the glorious sound of a Ferrari Enzo. Here's what the car looks like from the outside when it's being raised up by the axle lifter. You can see it actually gets decent ground clearance, more than enough to clear most speed bumps, or at least take them at a more reasonable angle. And now the car is going back down to its original position, which is also accompanied by an odd noise.
On the right, you have three buttons. There's race, that puts the car in race mode. There's ASR off, that turns off traction control. And finally, you have the button on the bottom, the silver button that says R. That's how you select reverse in this car. If you want to select every other gear, it's just like every other F1 paddle Ferrari. You just pull the right paddle to upshift, the left paddle to downshift, and you pull the two simultaneously to engage neutral. But reverse in this car is just that little silver button on the steering wheel. You want to go backwards, you press the silver button, and you're in reverse. Next up, I want to move behind the steering wheel. There's some really incredible stuff back there. Specifically, if you look closely, you can see the ductwork for the climate control vents behind the steering wheel and behind the gauge cluster. And check this out, you can also see the steering shaft. So when you turn the steering wheel, you can actually see the steering shaft turn as you turn the wheel. You will not see that in any other car. Every other car, they cover it. They make sure that's out of sight because it's a nice car and they have to make sure the people can't see that. But this this thing is basic, it's bare bones, it's stripped down, and so this car, you can actually see all that stuff behind the steering wheel. I've never been in any other car, especially a modern car, where you can see so much that goes on back there. Now next up, I mentioned that the turn signals are not controlled by the stocks coming off the steering wheel, and yet there still are stocks coming off the steering wheel, and they're very unusual. They're fixed in place. They don't move. Every other car, the one on the left moves for the signals, the one on the right moves for the wipers, but in this car, they're just fixed. Well, the way this works is you can turn on the headlights using sort of this little dial in the middle of the stock. It's actually kind of difficult to see, but if you sort of twist it upwards, then the headlights are on. Now that little flap at the end, that controls the high beams. If you push the flap down, it gives you just a flash of the high beams. So you can flash your lights by pushing that little flap down a few times. If you have the headlights on and you push the flap up, then it turns on the high beams permanently instead of just a little flash. Push the flap again, and then the high beams turn off. Now over on the right is the windshield wiper stock, and it works in sort of a similar manner. If you want to turn on the windshield wiper, you twist the dial from off to intermittent to on. Then again, there's a little flap at the end, and that allows you to control the speed of the windshield wiper. So if you have it on intermittent, you can select one or two, and it's the same deal if you have them on. You can select one or two, and that allows you to change the speed of how fast the wiper is wiping the windshield. But again, those stocks are fixed in position. You can only adjust the flap and the little dial in the middle. Next up, moving on to the middle of the Enzo's interior, you will notice that this car has no radio, none at all. In fact, it has no center screen either. Instead, the only things you'll find in the center are the climate controls, we'll get back to those in a second, and four buttons, the starter button, the hazard lights, the parking lights, and the rear fog light, that's it. And also the mirror controls. That was the entire center control stack of this car. No radio, no navigation, infotainment screen, just that stuff. Now, moving back to the climate controls, I wanna mention one interesting thing. If you look, you'll You'll see the climate controls only go from 19 degrees to 25 degrees. In Fahrenheit, that's 66 to 77. Those are your choices. It won't go colder than 66, won't go warmer than 77. If you turn on the climate control in the Enzo, you're not going to get really cold or hot. Apparently, you're just going to be sort of in a nice, comfortable middle temperature. Another interesting item in the middle, further down, in fact, between the two seats, that would be the cigarette lighter outlet. Instead of just having a normal cigarette lighter outlet cover, it has a cover with a prancing horse on it. It, which is the kind of thing that probably costs $900 at the Ferrari parts department to replace. Next up, we gotta talk storage. Now this car has no glove box, no surprise, it was lightweight, but there are some storage compartments throughout this cabin. For example, there are two little storage compartments in this carbon fiber piece in the middle. They're open, so you can't exactly keep anything there that you don't wanna fly around. There's also a storage compartment between the passenger seat and the passenger side door. The driver's side door has the parking brake there, but the passenger side has that little storage compartment there that you can use for all your stuff as long as you don't have much stuff. There's also one other storage compartment behind the seat. That would be this little net that you can also stick some stuff in. But again, not all that much. Now, this interior might seem really basic. No storage, like I mentioned, there's no screen in the middle. But interestingly, there is a screen in the gauge cluster. You turn on the car and that screen lights up. And that screen is interesting. Look over to the left and you can see that it shows engine oil pressure and a couple of temperature gauges. You can also see it's changing from a trip odometer to a total odometer. That happens when you tap the set button on the steering wheel. Meanwhile, you can also change from the gauges displayed like this to like this with some trip info. If you tap the mode button on the steering wheel, it may not seem like much now, but a screen and a gauge cluster was a big deal when this car came out. 
Oh, and one other funny thing about the screen. Look at that image in the middle. It's an Enzo from above. And as you open the doors, they turn red to let you know they've opened depending on which side is opened up. Close them and they go back to normal. Other miscellaneous interesting items in the interior. How about the fact that the mirrors are not mounted on the door. Instead, they're mounted on the front fenders. So when you open up the door, the mirrors stay put. I mentioned this as an interior detail because it's very strange when you're sitting inside the car. You look out over at the mirrors and they're not mounted right next to the door and the window. Instead, they're all the way up on the fenders. It's something that would take a little getting used to. And like you can see here, the mirrors can be blocked easily by this small pillar. You end up looking at them through the Enzo's small quarter window. Next up, another interesting detail. This car has floor mats, although not really in the traditional sense. The floor of this car is carbon fiber, just like basically everything else. But there are these rubber floor mats. They're not removable. You can't just stick them in. Instead, they're sort of grafted to the floor. So when I say the Enzo has floor mats, what I really mean is that there are rubber carbon fiber protectants on the floors. The last interesting interior item, that would be simply starting the car, which is sort of an interesting process. Now you saw that big red starter button before, but you can't use that to just turn on the car. Instead, you first have to turn the key like in a normal car, and only then can you press the starter button. I guess it was kind of a gimmick. I don't know why they didn't just let you turn the key, but starter buttons were all the rage when this car was coming out, and so, well, you turn the key and push a starter button. And then there are a couple of other interesting Enzo quirks I feel like I should go over that don't exactly relate to anything on the car. Instead, they're just about the car. One of those is the fact that you had to be invited to purchase the Enzo. Now, this is now pretty common with limited production Ferraris. You basically have to be invited to buy all of them. But at the time, this was the first one where that was the case. And it was a big news story. The Ferrari, you had to be invited to buy. It was ridiculous. And some people were very upset that even though they had the $650,000 thousand dollars to afford to buy this car even though they were a past Ferrari customer Ferrari wouldn't sell them one because there were simply more customers who wanted an Enzo hence why you had to be invited to buy the car another interesting piece about the Enzo has to do with the high performance version of the Enzo yes that's right there's a high performance version of a car with 660 horsepower it was called the FXX and it was one of the most bizarre programs I've ever heard of you could buy an FXX from Ferrari but you couldn't have it. You had to leave it with Ferrari and then they would fly it to various different track events around the world where you could use it. It was therefore technically your car, but it was retained in Ferrari's possession. It was one of the most bizarre things. There were a couple of people who took their FXXs away from Ferrari, but they weren't street legal. They were track only cars. So it wasn't like you could use them much anyway. Instead, Ferrari would send you a note and say, your FXX will be at whatever racetrack. And then if you want it, you could go and hang out with it. And so those are all the quirks and features of the Ferrari Enzo, or the Enzo Ferrari, I guess, doesn't matter. Anyway, unfortunately, I wasn't able to drive the Enzo today, but I will leave you with this. Zero to 60 in 3.1 seconds, 222 miles an hour, ultra limited production, one of Ferrari's five great modern supercars. Add it all up and it's no surprise these things are selling for $3 million. And in fact, when you think about some vintage Ferraris with significance are selling for 10, 20, $30 million, I suspect they're Maybe a day in the future when we look back on this era and reminisce about how you used to be able to get an Enzo so cheap.